Good morning. Today is Wednesday, May the 2nd, 2007. I'm Lee Cook. We're very pleased this morning to have with us Dr. D. Royce Boyer, a retiree from UAH, longtime faculty member and chairman, and we're so pleased to have you with us. I might say also my good friend, <laughs> Royce Boyer. Thank you, Lee. Royce, um, we talked a little bit beforehand. Would you I'd kind of like to lead you through your life, maybe starting from your early days, up, take us up through your college career and what you were doing then, and, and I guess people might say, why music? Why that? <laughs> you devoted your life to. Well, uh, I grew up in uh, North Manchester, Indiana as a young boy. My father was a college music professor at Manchester College, uh, and then during the uh, early 40s, during the World War II, my mother and he split up. And mother and I moved around to Florida, your home state, I believe, and to Maryland, and uh, Virginia, well, not Virginia, uh, back to Indiana. And fortunately, my mother and father got back together at the end of World War II in Arlington, Virginia, where we uh, lived. And I went to high school at Washington Lee High School in Arlington where I had a, a superb musical experience, both in the, particularly the choir, but uh, a good band. I played trombone and euphonium in the band, and I, I helped sort of get a high school or, uh, orchestra together. And another fine teacher in orchestra came on board. And then about my senior year, I told my father that I thought I wanted to be a music professor or music teacher, I didn't know exactly. And actually I didn't know whether I wanted to be in the vocal side or the, co or the uh, instrumental side. But my father had the presence of mind to say, young man, you better learn how to do something else too. <laughs> so... Sounded uh, like familiar advice. My parents <laughs> it, was, it was great advice as I think through my life. So I went to Chicago the year before I started conservatory in Indianapolis to learn piano tuning. And I had a fabulous experience there. Uh, I won't go into that, but uh, anyway, that interim year, and it helped me grow up a little bit too. Uh, then I went to Conservatory College at Jordan Conservatory of Music, which is now part of Butler University in Indianapolis, and did my baccalaureate, and had some excellent uh, experiences there. Uh, and then um, I was drafted into the Army in the middle of my senior year, last semester of my senior year. And uh, I sort of expected to start in the Army uh, even right away. Um, but when I went home uh, to Washington, see, I, was in, I lived in Washington then, I auditioned for the U.S. Army Chorus. And I wasn't really drafted in the Army until the end of September. This was what year? Uh, uh, it would have been 57. 57. <coughs> And I did some kind of work that summer. I don't remember. I won't go into that. But uh, I got out of college, at least without the big debts that so many students have today. I didn't have any money, but at least I wasn't uh, in debt. And uh, so I went to basic training at Fort Benning, Georgia, in uh, September 31st of 1957, and expected really to go to... Uh, uh, Germany. I was uh, training as a, <coughs> excuse me, as a chaplain's assistant. It turned out I had that, but I got deaf from the rifle. I was stone deaf leaving the rifle range, <coughs> and then I got Asian flu. Sound like I have it now, don't I? I remember. <laughs> so, yeah, it was the first round of Asian flu, and Fort Benning was just inundated with it. I mean, we had barracks after barracks uh, quarantined. And, and it was the sickest I've ever been in my life, if you want to know the truth. But eventually, I was on guard duty guarding the PX, as any good uh, recruit would be doing one morning uh, near the end of my basic training. And the orderly came down and said, Boyer, you're going to Washington, <laughs> which was really good news, if you want to know the truth. So in 24 hours, I was back in Washington, and I lived at home the first year I was in the Army. And I had a terrific career with the U.S. Army Chorus. Um, 
Did you travel abroad when you? Were well, we didn't travel that much. We traveled uh, somewhat. Went to Dallas once, once to Detroit once. No, we didn't travel abroad at all. But we sang, of course, around Washington a lot. And I ended up being a rehearsal conductor. I couldn't conduct a performance because I was an enlisted man. So <coughs> oh, I have a frog in my throat. So I had a, some wonderful experience singing with fine singers and then conducting them in rehearsals. And sort of learning um, to do a, a performance of light pop music, mostly pop music we did. We did some serious stuff, but most of the time we entertained with patriotic songs and army songs and, you know, familiar arrangements. Uh, excellent arrangements, so I might add. So I had that experience. <coughs> and I got out in uh, uh, August of 61 after applying to several uh, graduate schools. I did my master's at Catholic University while I was in the, Army. in the Army. I didn't quite finish it, but I but I finished it shortly thereafter with my thesis. And I went, I had an excellent offer at the University of Texas in Austin. It couldn't have been a better place. Uh, they gave me a, uh, you know, it was cheap. <laughs> they gave me a TA and uh, I had an excellent mentor. And I was given uh, one of the several choral organizations, which were called the Longhorn Singers, which was sort of up my alley after the Army Chorus because they were, a, well, I called them a fun group. You know, they they were they about the six, six, sing, about sixty singers. There's not much audition to it, and we sang Texas songs and folk songs and stuff like that. You learned and, all the A and M jokes. Uh, yeah, sure. some of that, <laughs> and. Uh, Anyway, uh, I built that organization up while I was there to 80, I guess. And I was getting so many requests. Of course, I was trying to get to graduate school, too. And I had excellent uh, uh, teachers, uh, mostly German musicologists. And I was really in a musicology program to start with. Uh, that I uh, had to start a smaller group which I called the Varsity Singers, or the Longhorn Varsity Singers, which was uh, like 15, 14, 15 singers. And uh, to go out and just entertain organizations that were called in and asked for, for that, you know, Qantas clubs, women's clubs, and all that. <clears throat> and, uh, and being the uh, ignorant, broke graduate student that I was, I decided we need to take this group on tour. So uh, the second year, I wrote <clears throat> about 15 military bases up through the Midwest. And my sister lived in Lafayette, Indiana. So I had a guaranteed place for a performance there and a place to stay with my kids and all that. And the first response I got, now this may not be pertinent to this interview, but it's fun to talk about. Uh, I got a request from Wirt Smith Air Force Base in northern Michigan, as far away as I could get, for two nights. They wanted me for two nights. And, and the military people would put us up free and, and feed us, you know. So all we had to do was get there and back. <clears throat> so that was the turnaround point of that tour and uh, we sang uh, almost every night and went I don't know 2,000 miles <laughs> and I started out with enough money in my back pocket to put gas in the tank to the next destination I mean it's just typical graduate student craziness I guess maybe maybe I'm over speaking your graduate life but we had a great tour and uh, then next year we went to Florida and then the next year I got my first USO DOD uh, entertainment um, through auditions to entertain military troops in this case it was to the Northeast Command which was Greenland, Iceland, Argentia, uh, 
Canada, Labrador. I mean, cream of the crop. Yeah, right? the cream of the crop <laughs> <laughs> experience. And we went there in February. It was dark all the time, you know. Oh. So right before that uh, trip, which was January of 66, I had asked the, the dean of the music school when he went to the music uh, administrator's convention in uh, Thanksgiving to look into some jobs for me. And I was interested in a choral job. <clears throat> and he came back after that and said, Royce, those jobs aren't jobs because they didn't fund them or they've been filled or something like that. But there's a chance in Huntsville, Alabama to start a music program. And I think you ought to look into that. It's just a chance of a lifetime. So I called a couple of my former mentors and asked them, you know, Alabama really in those days, that's 66, wasn't the place I really wanted to go. But um, there weren't that many jobs out there either. So about a week before I left on this USO trip to Greenland, I came here and interviewed at UAH. And Charlie Scott, Charlie fine, he's a director of uh, general studies, was that his title in the early days? I don't remember as before yeah. I came, but... Yeah, he, he was... He, he was uh, the number two man. He, sure. Yeah, he was uh, number two. He met me at the airport, which is the old airport off of uh, now South Parkway. Right. And um, that evening, and I, I stayed across the street from Morton Hall, which was then a brand new Sheridan Hotel. I, I'm probably the first person in the room. It was a really nice place. I was impressed. <laughs> and um, that night, um, Philip Mason, who was had been the, sort of the uh, administrator of the night program at the old Butler High School when it was a when it was just a whatever, um, had assembled Francis Roberts and a couple music people in town. Dorothy Adair was one, Sue Reed was the other. Mm -hmm. And they took me a little driving tour around Old Town and uh, past the Church of Nativity, which is, of course, an impressive old building. And we went to dinner. And then I interviewed with Clyde Reeves, who was the vice president in those days, the next day, and maybe a couple other people. Who was then the number one. Yeah, so yeah, we didn't have a president office. yet. Yeah. Clyde president Reeves yet. was our top administrator. Right. And then we had the interview at Tuscaloosa. Right. So Charlie Scott drove me down through Jasper and down the old way to Tuscaloosa, and I interviewed with the music people there and the dean of arts and science. Stayed the night there and flew back to Austin from from uh, there. Well, then I went back to Texas and two or three days later we took off for tour. Greenland. Well, about the time I got to Saunders from Greenland, which was our second stop, which had been the second week of that tour, more of southern Greenland, but still dark and cold, I got a telegram offering me the job. And I had several weeks, uh, three weeks, maybe four weeks to, you know, make up my mind. And I really didn't send in my agreement, not that I was questioning it so much, but I was busy doing other things uh, with my group uh, to take the job. Uh, and then, of course, I had uh, my mentor at Texas took a group to Europe, so I took over his a cappella choir. Another excellent experience. Took them to Mexico on tour that spring before I came here, and tried to finish up some of my graduate work. And I was a church musician down there. I had an excellent, big Lutheran church job that was just, I, I did major works, and again, lots of musical experience, conducting experience and like, uh, which prepared me for whatever career I've had. Uh, then um, uh, in August, I, oh, I came through here in June, and I had my car loaded with books, and my then wife and I were going to her home in Washington, where her parents still lived, to, to take a little vacation, and I dropped a bunch of books off on the way, and I remember Nan Hall, who was the registrar for many years, and she was in, uh, and her staff were having a lunch picnic 
that day we came through and they invited me right behind Morton Hall in the woods back in there to join them for a picnic where I got to meet some people. Crystal McCandless was probably there. She was the head of the library. Right the library. Um, and, and then um, went back to Texas and I happened, and it's pertinent because of the Virginia Tech thing that just happened, I was amongst those in the shootings at the University of Texas, which was a horrendous day. Mm. Fortunately, I wasn't, I wasn't shot, or I didn't get, really come close, but it was not fun. Believe me, it was a shocker day. And the paper eventually published the deceased, and there was an R. Boyer shot dead. And the people here in Huntsville thought they were going to have to look for another musician or music person. Turned out our boy was Robert Boyer, a physics uh, uh, graduate student whom I didn't know. Wasn't me, fortunately. <clears throat> and uh, then came here in August. I was given room, what was called Room 100 in Morton Hall in those days. It's now 200. But half of it was, on the south end, was consumed with the library uh, uh, cataloging new books. And UAH, there were only two buildings on campus, yeah. Morton Hall on the north end and Research Institute on the south end with Madison Hall, which is we call the Graduate Studies Building, was under construction. How are those two buildings connected, Royce? Tell okay, well, I'll get to that in a minute. Okay. Uh, so I had the north half of Room 100 for my music introduction is a music appreciation class and I started a choir called the UAH choir and had 30 nicely balanced group of singers 10 of them were from Butler High School and I had I looked for the best looking student I could find female student to sit in the registration line with me <laughs> and I had printed up signs at the uh, UT Union to say Beginning a new tradition. I remember what it says exactly. Join the UAH choir, MU, I can't remember the number, but like 001. <laughs> and meets uh, whatever we decided, Monday, Wednesday, Friday at noon. Uh, and so I, I printed up three or four or five of those and posted them. Everybody uh, uh, went through Morton Hall to register in those days. You didn't have computers and stuff like that. So it was a long process. Anyway, we re-recruited uh, 30 good students, and I wanted to say something here that I think is pertinent, because I've talked to a couple of those original students, and I think there was a lot of pressure. They had had a very fine choral experience at Butler High School with the director there, and they are out here with no music whatsoever. And I think there was a lot of pressure upon Charlie Scott or other people to get some music going. Yeah. I don't know if that's true or and, not. Well, at the time, but, too, Butler was uh, our largest theater school. Yeah, it was. And Jerry Tedford was the choral director there who was very fine. He was very fine. And I think that uh, that had a lot to do with them looking for somebody to start music activities. So, so we, you and you, you were all... Uh, yeah, it was, yeah, I was alone. And uh, the library was down the hall in Morton Hall, but all these new books, I mean, semi-trucks would back up to the door there you know, with boxes and boxes and boxes of new books from the new California library, uh, college library. And these librarians were in there all the time, and they were there all the time while I was teaching whatever I was teaching. So uh, eventually, Madison Hall opened up, which you call the Graduate Studies Building. I forgot it was called that. And it was called Madison Hall because the money didn't come from the state. It came from people giving money from Bad Madison County, which is That's unique uh, for a state institution to be financed in that way for a new building. Well, you may remember, though, uh, the Graduate Studies Building actually was called that because of an agreement with the Army who was putting in money that only graduate courses would be taught there. Okay, and that, that went on for that years. I, did, I didn't know that. I know your math department was in there for years. And that's why. I didn't know that. Yes, you are absolutely I didn't know that. Well, Madison Hall. 
My choir, the UH choir, sang its first performance for the Kiwanis Club in the Russell Erskine Ballroom Hotel downtown in like November. That was the place at the time. Well, it was the only place. At the time. Yeah, it was the only place. We sang, we sang in sweaters. We didn't have any costumes to wear or anything like that. That was our very first performance in the fall of 67. And then uh, Harold Steele was the administrator for the night school, right. which was still going on at uh, in Morton Hall. It had started in the old Butler High School, which is now, I think, a junior high school. It is. And, uh, but Harold was, uh, and he was a trumpet player, pretty good player. And so I wanted to get some, I was trying to get visibility, and I was trying to get publicity for my program and all that. So we constructed a wreath, uh, maybe six feet in diameter, and put greenery on it and lights, and hung it above the pillars of Morton Hall. And that December, and we were still in the uh, term system in those days, right. so we, we didn't uh, get out of school quite as early as they do now. We were still in December. So in early December, we had a carol sing in front of Morton Hall, and Harold played trumpet, and I could still play trombone in those days, and a couple other students, I don't remember who they were now, were the accompaniment. And we, uh, we had everybody, we had a big crowd actually, nothing much going on in this campus in those days. And we had our uh, carols uh, and a few readings, poems, and the president of the student body spoke, and probably the president did, or the vice president, I don't remember who spoke, but uh, a nice evening there in front of Morton Hall. It's cold that night, I remember that. Uh, then in the spring, uh, I don't remember all the performances, but one of them was the dedication of Madison Hall. In May, I think it was. Right. So the choir, by that time we had some nice looking blue robes with um, gold uh, stoles. And, you know, we looked like a choir. And we sang the dedication of Madison Hall that spring of 67, that would have been. I went back to Texas summer of 67, finished up my doctorate. I had a couple of things to do. So that's uh, pretty much the beginnings. And then uh, getting from uh, when Madison Hall opened, probably that next fall, the library was split. I mean, it's hard to believe this. <laughs> it's hard to believe this. But like A through L was in, Ma in Morton Hall, and M through Z was in Madison Hall. So, uh, and there was only one card file, and it was in, Ma in Morton Hall. So you, you, we didn't have, you know, people that see this later on don't realize that there were just three by five cards. You know, there wasn't computers in those days. So if you wanted to find a book, uh, say with an uh, author whose name started with R, you had to come to Morton Hall and look it up and find out where it was. And if it was L through M, then you'd have to drive down to Madison Hall to find it. Well, Sparkman Drive in those days was a, just a two-lane paved road. And I don't remember exactly what University Drive was like, but it probably was a two-lane road, too. I don't remember. But you'd, you went out to, more, um, to uh, University Drive, and there was a little turnoff there, and you went up a dirt hill um, up to Sparkman Drive, and then down Sparkman, over to Madison Hall, and get the book that you wanted. There was no interior. <laughs> there, oh, there was no loop road. There was no interior roads whatsoever. Not, not whatsoever. That's it. And I think that's a, a defining issue that's still a part of our campus. And that is we're divided. Uh, we're still divided. Holmes Avenue is still a dividing issue for us. You know, the sciences and engineering are at the south end, and the liberal arts and now business and the like are at the north end. And uh, that that's much better, I'm sure. I'm not around that much anymore, but uh, that, that was a real issue. It was. And at Mark Bauer's funeral this afternoon, I'm going to say that, you know, Mark was an engineer that I was on the faculty senate with that was a real pleasure to get to know. Otherwise, I never would have known him. It's hard with that. Because he was down there and I was up here. 
Okay, well, uh, stop me now if so I'm... Now you've, just to set the stage, we're in the end of 67, our students, their degrees still came from the University of Alabama, mm -hmm. and as I recall, or as I think I recall, they had to go to Tuscaloosa if they wanted to march and be in the commencement. We had a, a ceremony, the first one was on south of the Research Institute, there's a wonderful picture. Yeah, that I, uh, I hope will be in the file. Joe Daddle is Joe sort Daddle. of playing. Sound asleep. And we had Andy Holt, who was the president of the University of Tennessee, was our, our uh, speaker. And, of course, uh, so he was a speaker. And it was a hot, hot afternoon. We're looking at the sun. And we're all happy about everything. And he gave a speech, which I shouldn't say anything derogatory about it, but it was not a good... It, he, he spoke down to us like we were a bunch of country bumpkins, and and we we were trying to establish a fine school. And we knew what we were, and we did a pretty good job of it, I think. Not just me; I'm talking about everybody right. on the faculty in those days. Um, but I I remember he finished his speech, and he was relating qualities of the person with a Cadillac, and of course he he picked a high quality car and he was saying you know this and that the, you need to be as good as a Cadillac in certain ways and that this is crazy and it went on and on <clears throat> and he had to leave to go to another speech I think he was speaking in Tennessee somewhere to catch an airplane or something so he was walking out to the north uh, toward then Madison Hall and Clyde Reeves our vice president over the PA system. Thank you, Andy, for a great speech. And Andy Holt cupped his hands and yelled back, Clyde, that wasn't a great speech. That was a hell of a speech. <laughs> and that was our first commencement, first although our students had to go to Tuscaloosa to get their diplomas. Right. And that didn't make us very happy. No, I, no, I remember and everything I wanted, everything I wanted in music, if I wanted erasers or piece of music or something, I had to put a purchase order in to go to Tuscaloosa. Our checks came from there, and we were very much uh, not a part of ourselves in those days. But eventually that changed when Ben Graves was made a president. Was that 69 or 70? That would be, he came on in March of 70. Okay, that, that sounds about right. he retired in 69. Okay, right. so March of 70. And that gave us some autonomy. Right. We and we were, of course, we were under accreditation through Tuscaloosa. The umbrella. And we did, though, stand our own accreditation in a 68. We went through the process. One and I, right. Yeah, and I, uh, I was chairman of the Physical Facilities Committee, which didn't amount to much didn't in those days. <laughs> didn't have any buildings there to worry about. Bizarre. But I learned a lot. And uh, anyway, that's another story. But uh, uh, we did stand our own accreditation and then about 70 or 71 70 I think uh, we well in the year after I came we hired a second music faculty member uh, Mary Elizabeth Ricks was her name and John Rogers I think may have been chairman or uh, dean by then and about 70 or 71 we wanted to develop music degree and uh, he or whoever the dean was it was, was then Wayne Brayton at the time maybe so they thought well we need a third person to solidify a faculty for a degree and it was a BA degree in music um, the conductor of the Huntsville Symphony had angina problems mm -hmm. uh, Russell Gerhardt was his name and they were bringing in guest conductors because he couldn't conduct. So we made a search for a new conductor, and uh, through negotiation, we uh, developed a halftime at UAH and a halftime with the orchestra to put together a salary. That's interesting. That's a fact I did not know. Yeah, and uh, one of the guest conductors from Arkansas was Marx Pales, mm -hmm. and Marx was brought on board as our third faculty member, as a half-timer, but yeah. still he had a Ph.D. and, you know, it, it gave us some integrity. And we then and were able to...
Oh yeah, oh yeah, no, I, no. And our students could play in the orchestra then for credit if you know they were competent, mm -hmm. and we did have a few of those. So that's how that sort of came about. That's interesting. And uh, then uh, we were still in Wharton Hall in room 100 or 200 now. We were given uh, a room upstairs for some office space, maybe a classroom too. Uh, I don't remember exactly where. The language lab. They made a language lab there. We were right above 100 in that. And then I was in uh, the Butler buildings. We had steel buildings behind uh, Morton Hall, two or three buildings back there were English and history. I was actually housed with English department for at least a year, if not two years, as an office. <clears throat> uh, and, and, and I learned those are some of my closest friends still, by the way. Right. I, I just talked to one last night, as a matter of fact. Um, but anyway, desperately we needed a building. We needed space and, uh, of course, pressured to get it. And finally, the uh, General Studies building was designed. There's two buildings, a, a two-story building, which is going to be music, and a six-story building which was going to be English and history and art. Well, the bids came in and there wasn't enough money to build it all. So, uh, and this was like 68 or 69. <clears throat> right. And uh, so I just thought, well, the, be the best thing they're going to do is just cut off the music building. It'll save some money. And they'll uh, put me anywhere. And, you know, <laughs> so selfish self I was. Uh, so I just about camped out in front of Joe Daddle's office in Morton Hall. What are you going to do about this? You know, I'm not leaving this town until I know that A, that B building's not going to get torn, uh, cut off. Well, indeed it didn't. And they took two, two floors off the A building and, uh, and made it uh, four stories and two stories. And it's still there, of course, called Roberts Hall now. Right. After Named after Francis Roberts, who is a very key individual in our faculty formation, believe me. She was a mentor to me, even though she's a historian. So that's how that building sort of came about. And uh, now the music department here in uh, 19, or 2007 are desperately for more space now, but uh, that's going to come about in time. Um, so that's how Roberts Hall sort of got built. It's, it's not a really fine building, but uh, boy, we were glad to have it. Believe me, we just needed space desperately. And, and of course, uh, English and history were there, art. And English moved back over to Morton Hall, and business program developed, and economics was taken out of the liberal arts college, and a new building was built. And that, of course, helped with the space too. The Bevel Center, I ate lunch there a couple days ago after many years I haven't been there. Boy, that was just, we were uptown when that building was built. Right, hundred I, I mean, we had a nice place. Mm -hmm. It was looked good, it was upscale, and it, it was a very meaningful building to our faculty. And, and mostly faculty, I don't think students too much ate over there, but uh, that was a nice thing. And of course, oh, I need to speak a little bit about the uh, uh, interim Union Building, which is now the University Center. Somewhere along there, I don't know the year, uh, a interim union was built, which amounted to a, a, a gymnasium and some rooms. And some of the student services were moved over there from Morton Hall. And I ran the cultural series, you know. We had this cultural arts series. Had a little series. cafeteria. Had a little snack bar cafeteria in it. And I... Uh, I, uh, we started out the U UAH uh, cultural series, I think we called it. That was part of my contract, actually. Right. And the first event we had was in the Sheridan Inn at the ballroom. Mm -hmm. And then we used Huntsville High School Auditorium right. some. I remember. But eventually we could use this gymnasium. Um, so we had events there. And then the Von Braun Center was built in 74, 75. Uh, and uh, we started using the Playhouse. Actually, UH had the first event in the Playhouse. Oh. St. Martin's Smith Square Chamber Orchestra. It's the first event ever to 
be in the cha- in the playhouse, which wasn't a very good place because acoustics weren't really right. But that's what that's a fact. And then we, uh, of course, the orchestra moved in there, and we began to present things in the big hall as well. So that was a part of my job too. Well, you're getting into an area that that I want to explore because I happen to know from our long years of friendship. You were involved in a myriad of activities in town. And you just talked about UH Cultural Series, which of course we were on the campus and in town. But talk about some of the activities you had, some of the groups you developed. I mean, for example, Village Singers was probably the best known. Mm. And, and your association with the symphony and the chamber music field. Tell us a little on that. This was, you were a great ambassador for the town and gown concept. Yeah, Huntsville is, was, is and was an incredible city. It didn't depend upon UAH for its cultural life. It had its own cultural life. And uh, we, we contributed to it in time more and more. But the thing I liked about Huntsville was that if you ought to do anything, you could find people in town that would, would do it. Talented Was people. there much, I'll say the arts in quotes, you've, you've, you've started, Royce, getting into an area I really want to explore with you. You were involved with a myriad of activities <clears throat> you know, in the town. You had several groups, probably the Village Singers was the best known. I know you were active with the symphony, very active with the chamber music uh, group, a prime mover in the mm-hmm. early years. Talk to us a little bit about some of those things, be it because it it, it give, you were a wonderful representative for the old town and gown concept. Yeah, it was mostly town because Huntsville really didn't need a college to get its cultural life going. It was really very active culturally. That stems, I did a lecture early on. I can't remember the content of it, but the cultural life of Huntsville is very rich from its almost beginnings. But uh, the Germans coming in with von Braun and his team, von Braun was a fiddle player. And other of the members of that team were string players, and they used to get together in their homes and play music, what what they called house musics. Um, And that was the formation of the Huntsville Chamber Music Guild. It's interesting, it's called a guild. I think that's a very interesting name, still is. When was that formed? Well, before I came. Before I came, yeah, in the fifties, yeah, in the fifties, probably. Yeah, they they were playing in their homes and stuff, and they finally decided they wanted to get some professional uh, ensembles to come in, you know, and so they began to one or two a year, something like that, bring in. They were German groups, I'm sure, uh, just to set the tone of professional quality, and this before my time now. Uh, my association really was early on in the chamber guild. <clears throat> I'm not a string player, but I love chamber music, and I remember distinctly uh, Marvel Smythe, a violin player in the orchestra. These were Robert Larkin was another early uh, a string player. Uh, other people I can't remember now. Uh, meeting in my home over in Claremont. Uh, with the Huntsville phone book, going through page by page, weeding out names on our mailing list because the people have moved on. You know, Huntsville is very transient At place. Early in that time. Yeah, very transient. And this was sixty six or seven, mm-hmm. and uh, to get our mailing list, and, and of course we put together some kind of a program. And I conducted a chamber orchestra as the first event for three or four years in September because uh, the orchestra hadn't started yet and there was a chance for three or four rehearsals and we did some repertory uh, and that was in the early days of, of Roberts Hall because uh, I remember we performed on that stage so that would have been 71 maybe right. about that but I remember in the early days and of course I was a part of the Chamber Guild board for years uh, and uh, we struggled along, uh, and having the Roberts Hall Recital Hall was a real nice step forward to have a nice place to perform. Otherwise, we were in uh, the old uh, 
uh, Clinton Avenue uh, school down, well, not Clinton Avenue, is uh, on Randolph Street, that school there. It's uh, where the education offices where, are now. Okay. Yeah, that I think was it was junior old, at Huntsville, was old. Huntsville High School, or Huntsville High School Junior High. Yeah. But they had this old, rattly uh, um, auditorium uh, that we performed, had, had our groups perform in there some. <laughs> Um, we uh, the, also the little theater. I, this is backtracking a little bit, but the room 100 in Morton Hall was a lecture hall. It's a flat floor, had maybe 70, 80 seats with pull-up desks, and uh, to make room for me, so I could have a rehearsal room and some space and the library, they gave all those seats to the Huntsville Little Theater. And they had taken over the Clinton Avenue School, right there below downtown. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's there anymore. I think they've torn it down now. Near the, near the Greyhound bus station now. Oh, no, it's not. No. Yeah. Well, they, they, that was another auditorium. And uh, anyway, that, for theater, that's, that's what was used. And then we had uh, Bob James came along and started some... Playhouse of the UH and and he was very generous with his time. In fact, he's directing a play. Yeah, he yeah he had an interest in that, and we had a you know just a club. It wasn't a class, anything like that. Well, that's backtracking a little bit. The Village Singers. I like to talk a little bit about them. Uh, I'd had experience with the Longhorn Varsity Singers, which I started, and had won this USO tour and. Of course, I was anxious in getting visibility and trying to promote music on UAH. <clears throat> so a friend of mine from Texas mo had moved to Centenary College, and he was in theater, but he was an astronomer, really, but he was uh, uh, in theater and had worked with me at Texas in uh, choreography. And he went to high school with me in Arlington, actually. John Williams is his name. And John had moved to Centenary College, and he became the director for the Holiday in Dixie, which is a beauty pageant, and I think it still goes on in Shreveport, Louisiana. Mm. So he called me like the second year I was here and said, Royce, would you uh, bring a group down, like I brought my group up in Texas, to back up the, the show? Well, I had started the Village Singers the second year I was here as a Madrigal group. I never had a Madrigal group, and I wanted a Madrigal group, you know, Renaissance music and all that. And this call came, you know, in the late fall, and I said, boy, this is a chance, you know. So after Christmas sometime, we uh, did some, started doing some pop music and went down to Shreveport. Uh, we stopped a couple places en route, as I recall and did that Holiday and Dixie show, uh, just backing up, uh, I can't remember the star, there were a couple stars, you know, they brought in. And, uh, you know, it was a trip. I mean, that's, that's what sort of made music. Kids loved kids it. Kids loved it, yeah, kids, they loved, kids it. loved it, absolutely. And that set the tone then for the Village Singers. In the fall, we always started out as a madrigal group. Wonderful music training, blend, you know, all the good things about choral music. Then we entertained in December 15 to 25 Christmas entertainments. I mean, you know, oh, the, the, the Grace Christmas Club, the Kiwanis yeah. Club, you name it, churches. I don't know how we did it sometimes. I think how the kids stayed in school, frankly, we did so much. <laughs> well, they were 20 minute things, they weren't long, but still it took time away from everybody. And then after Christmas, we started to be a, what they call today a show choir. Not nearly as sophisticated as today. We we just used a couple mics and and did a little bit of dancing and choreography. But but the show choirs today are pretty sophisticated. And so that's they really what like that variety. I'll bet. Well, it worked well. And then we in the spring we'd usually take a short trip and we'd go into high schools and we would do some show stuff. But we'd always throw in a couple madrigals for music education and, and the recruitment. And recruitment. And the kids in the group loved to sing the, that really good music. They loved it. But anyway, I applied for another USO trip uh, in 70, 70 I applied, which was, you know, pretty young in the career. 
And lo and behold, we won the cream to cream. We got the Asian trip. Oh. Ten weeks in Asia. Ten weeks. This is in early 70s? 71. 71. In early 71. We had You've two, come a long way from two weeks. Greenland yeah. to... Uh, <laughs> and it was all, you know, they paid us. I mean, it wasn't, nobody had to pay anything. I didn't have to pay anything. Kids didn't have to pay anything. And uh, we were two weeks in Korea, four weeks in Japan, a week in Okinawa, uh, nearly a week in the Philippines, uh, a few days in Guam, and a few days in Hawaii. If I may, just for the, the audience who will be viewing this, this is something that happened. You came in 67. Six, 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 yeah. Within five years, you yeah. developed this, won the top prize. Yeah. Uh, starting from a faculty of well, one. I don't, you know, I I don't know how good we, we were, of what our competition was, but of course I'd had the one tour from Texas before, which I guess went well, and they had established some rapport with the USO. I'm just remembering where you started. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's a kick in the pants, mm -hmm. to say the least. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, we got another one. Uh, in 74, we went to Europe for 10 weeks. Germany mostly, West Germany, uh, Belgium, Netherlands. Well, we were in Italy, but we didn't sing in Italy. We took some days down there. So we got another USO tour in uh, 74. And then in the middle 80s, <clears throat> talking about the village singers now, which um, were you know, they had more visibility. The choir, of course, was going on. I mean, we did concerts, and the only trip the choir ever took was to Tuscaloosa. <laughs> and we sang, we sang, uh, uh, I think the only trip we took, now the choir since my time has gone on to some bigger places, but uh, anyway, uh, we then were asked to be uh, the um, Alabama and Guatemala, our partners of the Americas. Every state, or not every sister, state, but sister, sister, sister states. states. Sister, sister. And uh, we happened to be Guatemala, and the Remember. International Convention of the Partners of America was going to be in Guatemala. So I was asked to take the village singers down there. And I don't remember the exact year that was, uh, in the 80s. I could talk a day about that trip. <clears throat> Two weeks is all we were there. School superintendents was big on that. The sisters, yeah, sisters, yeah sisters, well, stuff yeah, that it was a terrific experience. And uh, actually, one of our members of the group ended up going down there and teaching for several years. Huh. He's back in this country now, but he, he went back down there. I've been there three times now. It's a great city, a great place to visit. I'm not sure how safe it is nowadays, but, but it was. It was daring in those days. But that was another wonderful experience the Village Singers had. And I had as a result of the Village Singers, mm -hmm. because I could go along too, you see. So that's probably enough about the Village Singers. Um, I'm not sure what I can say uh, more. Uh, our faculty grew to five or six in music. Of course, changed a good bit. I gave up. Uh, the choral part of it eventually and began teaching music history which is what I really pre was prepared to do in uh, my graduate work. Uh, City-wise we didn't finish that. I was on the symphony board for many years um, with the, with the um, I was on the uh, community chorus board for a while. <clears throat> I was a choir master at the Episcopal Church of the Nativity for 24 years which is a wonderful, had a wonderful choir there, took them to England twice. Um, uh, so, I, I mean, I just, I just had a fabulous uh, experience uh, here in Huntsville. Never dreamed I'd stay more than three or four years, frankly. I thought, you know, starting place. It's a great city. Let's see now, you retired uh, when? 97. 97, so you were here for 31 years. Yeah, uh huh. Um, been retired for. Mm -hmm. 10. Uh, 10, <laughs> about, same as. About 10, uh, right? Same as me. I retired the uh -huh. same year. When you come back now and you look at this campus, and of course you have old friends here that you see, what's your reaction? 
Well, I'm very satisfied. I mean, it's a, I'm so glad we got some dormitories, got resident students, which frankly was a disappointment because we waited many years for that. It makes a big difference. We were a commuter campus and kids would come, take their class, get in the car and leave. Or well, they'd sit in their car and study. You know, it just it was sort of sad in a way. And and of course the transientness of the students. As a choral director, I'd have a good tenor section in the fall, and I'd lose half of it in the spring. So I was some selfishness in there. But uh, I'm tr tremendously gratified by uh, my opportunities here. Uh, I, I hit it at the right time. <clears throat> uh, music department has its ups and downs. Uh, but uh, it's, grow, it's grown. Uh, campus looks like a campus. And every time I'm here, there's another stoplight I have to wait on. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, we've got a uh, uh, retired uh, faculty and staff association now that's making these uh, oral histories available. <laughs> which I was afraid would just, the, the past was going to evaporate. And uh, I, the older you get, in my experience anyway, it may not be true with everybody that gets older, but the more you remember of the early days, you, you, you think about things that happened. Uh, and I enjoy just sitting in a chair just thinking about things. I probably ought to be doing something more creative, but uh, that's something I do. But it's a it's a great school. The quality of of the academic quality is one of the very best, and that was very important to us. Francis Roberts and others in the science and engineering areas. <clears throat> uh, I'm sure you are one of them too in the math area. We we are adamant about wanting to be the best that we could be. And I think that that's the attitude of, of it. We're able to draw in excellent people now. We're not a provincial school. Right. You know, everybody doesn't come from Georgia and Alabama and Mississippi. We get people from all over the country and world to teach. We got students from all over the world. Uh, it's a it's a just a high quality institution, about the right size. I would say eight thousand students or so. A, a, a very uh, viable, energetic city that just doesn't seem to stop. Um, wonderful place in the country, you know, the climates are moderate, but you get changes of, of, of seasons and you got all the rivers and the mountains and it's just a terrific place. Uh, you know, I just thank my lucky stars that I ended up uh, having my career here. After you, well, I, I know that you have moved geographically, uh, and I guess I know you do some piano tuning in your retirement. Yeah. Uh, anything else that you would like to tell us about and that you're well, doing in your retirement years? I'm glad they give me a small contract to come up and tune pianos every month, <laughs> and I'm glad I can tune pianos. I mean, it's a it's a great part your time. Dad gave yeah, you my advice, my dad you? gave me good advice, and uh, it's fun. I get into the boonies and. I was in probably the richest man's house in Mississippi uh, last week tuning his nine foot Steinway, you know. But I get into some really. Up contacts. Yeah, I get into some really backwater places and uh, it, it brings me back here. Uh, and I hope it'll continue. I, uh, I, I really, uh, I really, I just feel very fortunate uh, for my career here and friends I've made and. Uh, so forth. I don't know if I've got a lot more to say, yet, uh, unless you've got some well, specific I gonna, questions. Uh, no, I was going to just say, did we miss anything? Anything <laughs> you want to say to to the folks who will view this in the future? That, uh, well, I um, I'm still concerned about the division of the south side of homes and the north side of homes, and I've long thought that we need some kind of a faculty club. I mean, the faculty act. Uh, overall is what keeps the university together. Um, I think anybody would admit that, students or administration. 
And uh, our faculty, now it may be better than I think, or, or more than I think now, because I'm not here that much, just doesn't have a place that they can gravitate toward. And uh, I'm going to speak uh, this afternoon briefly at Mark Bauer's uh, uh, memorial service, and I'm going to make an appeal that one of these houses in the middle of the campus be turned into the Bauer faculty house as for consideration may not be may not work out maybe someplace else is better but I think that would make I, I think that's one thing I'd like to say here is a criticism or as a constructive criticism mm -hmm. that I think somewhere we need to have that happen I think that would be wonderful I, I thank you uh, I think there is much more togetherness than maybe when you and I retired yeah I think coaches, it's probably but, yeah uh, some sort of a factor. Uh, yeah, my perception may not be accurate. Well, I know I, I think the, the, the divide still exists, um, but and certainly that's an interesting idea. Yeah. Uh, the current plans are for a, a large greenway. Down yeah, well, they the can move one of those houses to the oh, side. Yes, absolutely. They <laughs> They're going to move them anyway. They've already moved the car. <laughs> I was going to say they can move it. They're going to build a parking deck there. <laughs> Wherever, right? Yeah, well, they may be part of the parking deck would be a faculty club. I don't know, but uh, I've been on other campuses. In fact, when I interviewed at Tuscaloosa, they had an old house west of the campus. I remember that was their faculty club, right. and I they there. took me to lunch there. Right, and I met not just music faculty, but other faculty around the table that day. And I've eaten in that club several times. Yeah, well, I've only been there that one time. But I'll never forget it, and I've been on other in others too, of course, but. Uh, that's just something to leave here at the end of this interview. Uh, uh, it's, inevitably, it's going to happen when I don't know. It will. Yeah. It may take a, a yeah, may, years may take, uh, yeah, may take some years. But anyway, Lee, it's great to sit around the table with you. And, it has uh, been my pleasure we've to had have a, you here, and we appreciate you very much you coming and sharing your thoughts with us. Yeah, and, was, and thanks to Chuck Lundquist, who's sitting over here listening, uh, and who's really spearheading this yes. uh, and our technicians very, as well. Very valuable project. Yeah, I think it's valuable. Oh, I think it's it nice. is. Great. We really appreciate it. So long, Lee.